It's time to take off your clothes, enjoy clothes free living, and join us for Naked, Nudist, and Naturist. Welcome to Naked, Nudist, and Naturist, the show that celebrates clothes free living for all. I'm your host, Frank Stone. And I'm your correspondent, Lisa Monroe, and I'll be reporting on all things within the Naturist community. So it's time to get naked and join us. And enjoy clothes free living on Naked, Nudist, and Naturists. Well, greetings and welcome into Naked, Nudist, and Naturist, episode 53 today. We are excited to see you and spend this hour with you. We've been waiting 167 hours for this moment since our last show ended. Where have you been? You don't have to answer that. We're just glad you're here. The pool is open. The hot tub is fired up. The grill is going full bore. Fruit vegetables off to the right. Your favorite cold drink off to the left. Hot drinks inside. You see the full array of towels and suntan lotion. It's time to enjoy clothes free living for all of the right reasons for the next hour together. Well, as we begin year number two, a brand new show every Saturday morning, 6 o'clock a.m. Eastern Time on Spotify. We will have author Paul Z. Walker from the Netherlands. He's part of the Great Triumvirate, the Naturist Fiction Anthology people. But he's also an author in his own right. And he has a brand new book that just recently came out. So we'll talk to Paul Z. Walker about that. Lisa Monroe and I will throw out some terms today. We'll discuss them back and forth and try to find out what does it all mean. So we'll talk to Lisa about that. And then we'll have part one of my interview with Philip Oak. He wrote a book entitled Surprised into Freedom. Basically, they turned to naturism. He and his wife, he got rid of his pornography addiction. She got rid of her body image issues all through naturism. Can it really happen that way? Not only can it happen that way, it happens often that way. It happened to Philip Oak and his wife. So we'll have part one of my interview with Philip Oak and talk all about his new book. Big time, highly content filled show today. So let's dive right in. As we head over to the Netherlands for my interview with Paul Z. Walker, he's written a new book, and we want to talk to him all about it. So here we go, Paul Z. Walker. We are headed over to the Netherlands today to bring in a returning guest. He's been on a couple of times before. He's also part of what I call the great triumvirate of naturist anthologies with uh, Ted Bunn and uh, Will Forrest. They put those anthologies together. He's also a prolific writer in his own right, does a lot of naturist fiction, does a lot of other genres as well. Well, he just came out with a new book a few weeks ago, so let's welcome him to the show this morning. From the Netherlands, Paul Z. Walker. Good morning, Paul. How are you today, sir? Good morning, Frank. I'm doing well. How are you? Not bad. We talked a little before we started recording. Not quite summer weather yet, right? No, it's not. It's still um, on the chilly side here. I'm wearing clothes. It's not good. that's That's not fun. That's not... You need to move. We talked about that the last time. You need to find... Uh, maybe near the equator? Can you find a house right on the equator, right on the line? Uh, well, a little bit below or a little bit above would be good, yes. Okay. <laughs> I think I think that would work. I'm looking forward to retirement and moving to Fuerteventura. Here we go, Anne. <laughs> because that's that's just a great place for me to be. My girlfriend has a house there. I don't have like, uh, any problems with hay fever there. So that works. Well, good. Plus, you can say that word every day of your life for the rest of your life. Exactly. Every day, every hour. That's right. If I want. That's right. You're there. When I I do it over here, it sounds a bit silly and people look funny at me, even more than they usually do. But (laughs) That's right. You can call people randomly and just say, hey, I live in Puerto Ventura. You can just do that. They might think you're a little odd, but who cares, right? Well, they probably want to know when they can come over and stay for a few weeks. That's right. That's exactly how that works. And they get a a decent house. It doesn't even have to be a decent house. Warm weather, people are going to show up. People who don't even know will say, hey, Paul, can I spend the weekend with you? Yeah, I don't want to get in trouble with the lady who runs a and b over there, but it might be an option. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. All right, well, you came out with this uh, new book on June 8th of this year, just a few weeks ago. Little Eden and the Aluminum Factory. What in the world is all this about and how did this come to be? Uh, Let me start at the very end because the title came to me when I was still editing the book. It was completely written Mm -hmm. and um, it's about um, uh, a man who runs an aluminum factory and he wants to have his stock expanded. So he's looking for a new space to build a warehouse where customers can come up and pick up his stuff or from where the deliveries can be moved. 
this place that he wants, it's a plant nursery. So that's a bit of a problem because you don't move a plant nursery that easily. Mm. And he's trying all kinds of odd tricks and ways to find out if the people from the plant nursery have problems or if they can be bought or whatever it takes. But he doesn't have a straightforward approach of going there asking, can I buy your property? Mm -hmm. Which is something I found very amusing. <laughs> and he tries all kinds of things to get his hands on the property, including uh, uh, recruiting some family members to infiltrate. And I didn't have a title for the book until the very, very, very end. I was talking to a friend. I said, I don't have a title for the book yet. And then she said, well, you could call it something with Eden because of a plant nursery and gardens and stuff. I said, oh, yeah, but it's not big Eden. It's little Eden. Yeah. And then go. a few hours later, someone mentioned the film uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Yeah. So then I had little Eden and the aluminum factory. <laughs> and that's where that came from. Your brain is always working, isn't it? Yes, and it works in mysterious ways. <laughs> Some people call me crazy, and that's, um, well, I take that as a compliment. Absolutely. You're the kind of guy where teams of psychologists would review your case and study, and they just end up with, the guy's terrific. He's a genius. He's always thinking. Nothing wrong with Paul Z. Walker, right? Um, I would hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like the way my mind works. I'm used to it. That's right. That's right. Well, in your uh, description on your website, it says, uh, this book is a story of real life, nothing sci-fi, nothing fantasy, not even steampunk and ray guns. How is it real life? What's going on? There's a family involved, um, is that right? Yeah, there is a family involved. The family is the owner, are the owner of the, uh, the, the nursery. There's also a family attached to the man who owns the uh, aluminum factory. Mm -hmm. And these families don't know each other, but they're da the daughter and the, the son of each family member or at each family, they get in touch without knowing who the other is. Okay. And there is, it's just a story that someone suggested. They said, you always write science fiction or steampunk or fantasy, but can't you, can't you write a story without any of that? Mm -hmm. Without even real mystery? Because I wrote a detective story. I have my Emma Nelson stories. Yeah. I said, okay, this is interesting. I have no idea how to attack this or how to approach this. So I started scribbling some notes and thoughts and how would this happen? And at some point I started writing mm -hmm. and slowly but surely everything started falling into place. I actually set up a complete spreadsheet with several storylines because there is the family with the, uh, with the nursery. There is the family with the aluminum factory. Right. There is the son who is an artist. There is a daughter who works in a disabled people home. Okay. There is uh, a nudist beach. Mm -hmm. There is a bar with a transgender man. Okay. And all these things started to come together. Mm -hmm. And I, then I had to find ways of how do I connect all these people? That, that's tricky too. You can't just throw everybody in a room and say, okay, now you all get to meet each other and then make a story out of that. Right. That's my right. job. That's right. Well, you know, the, the creative process is always fascinating to me. As a writer, you can sit there for billions of hours plotting and scheming and thinking, or you can do what you just said a few moments ago. You thought everything out, and then you just sat down to write. And basically, let's see what happens here as you're developing the story, right? Yes, and my problem usually is when I start figuring things out and writing them down, I start writing, and within one chapter, the whole story diverts from the plan, <laughs> and everything goes somewhere else. I always curse my characters because it's their fault. That's right. Kind yeah, of I told you to do this. No, 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 no. We're going that way. No, that way. No, we're going that way. Just keep writing. We'll figure this out for you. Oh, damn, again. Yeah. Does anybody overhear you arguing with your characters in, in your writing room? Uh, only my cats. So okay. that's good. So, yeah, you're safe there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sometimes my girlfriend hears that. Yeah. But she also writes. So she understands that. So sometimes we are talking to each other without hearing what the other is saying because we're thinking out loud as yeah. we work on our stories. Well, heck, that, that works. Now, also on your website, it says uh, the book will evolve into interesting situations, romantic meetings, and the obvious revelation of the advantages of naturism, nudism, whatever you call it, is what you put. Yep. 
how does naturism, nudism, or whatever you call it, fit in here? I, I know you mentioned nudist beach, but anything else going on? Um, yes. Um, I don't want to give away too much of the story, right. but uh, the family who owns the nursery works there naked. Okay. When the weather allows, they work there naked. So um, the daughter who works in a disabled people home, she sometimes has a few men or, and women from the home who want to go out and do something. They, they're not the, the very disabled people. Mm -hmm. And then she puts them in a bus, takes them to the nursery, they get out of their clothes and they help taking care of plants, watering them, cleaning, and they have a great time outside their clothes. So that's great. Yeah. And there's nothing to it. It's just people taking care of plants without messing up their clothing. Yeah, it, and that's not all that unusual. The more I talk to people in the farming industry or growing plants, it's not as unusual as people might think that it is. They're out there in nature to begin with. They just take their clothes off because, it, you know, if they keep them on, they're going to get filthy. They're going to have to wash clothes every night, and they might not get some of the dirt and grime off, whereas on your skin, it just kind of comes right off with soap and water. So exactly. Not, yeah, not totally unusual, and I'm glad you incorporated that in there. And you don't want to give the ending away, of course. Is this a, a standalone book? Are you looking at making a series out of this or what? Uh, for now, it's a standalone book. Okay. I don't see any sequel coming out, but I never say never. That's right. You never. I never know. I, Naked Crow also started out as a standalone book, and I'm working on book number 13 at the moment. So <laughs> That's right. You might walk into your room later today and... One of your characters might yell at you, hey, Paul, sit down and start writing volume two right now. And then before you know it, you'll be writing volume two. Yeah, I wouldn't count on that not happening. Right. <laughs> yeah, really, really. Yeah, my characters are always with me. They're always in my head and yeah. always plotting and scheming and tricking me into writing something extra. Mm -hmm. So this wouldn't surprise me. For now, let's first see how people like it. And if people don't like it, then there won't be a sequel. Right. And if people like it, they will probably ask for more. Oh, absolutely. I, I don't think there's any question people will like this. Uh, Paul Z. Walker, his book, Little Eden and the Aluminum Factory. And Paul, how can people buy this book and how can they uh, get more information on you? Well, uh, as you know, I have a website, justtheme.org. Mm -hmm. There is a, a lot of off in me information. There is a menu which points them to my book. You can find it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Kobo, Apple Books, Google Play. There's a paperback on Amazon. And there's a lot more sh stops, shops where you can find it, but that's that's all small stuff, like Vivlio and Tolino and whatever. Okay, very good. And then you guys, uh, along with uh, Will Forrest and Ted Bunn, you have your anthology coming out next week, right? The 4th of July? Yes. Yep. Wow, very good. It's an exciting time for you. You have uh, your own brand new book uh, released a few weeks ago on June 8th, your anthology July 4th. What are you going to do for an encore for the rest of the summer? Um, I'm going to finish up my Naked Through 13, Mirror Earth number 6, Sky Ghost number 2. I have a, uh, a vampire story in the works and a few other things. I'm, I'm not even sure if I remember all of them. <laughs> okay. Well, always great to talk to you. We appreciate you coming back on. Paul Z. Walker, his newest book, Little Eden and the Aluminum Factory. And Paul Z. Walker, go out there and have a great close free day. We'll talk again soon. Thank you very much. You have a great day too, Frank. Bye-bye. On my best to all the team. All right. Thank you. The very terrific Paul Z. Walker, author from the Netherlands, part of the great triumvirate, as I call them, with Ted Bunn and Will Forrest and their naturist fiction anthologies. Paul is an author in his own right. Check out his website. Check out his books. A terrific author. And as you can tell, especially from the beginning of the interview, his mind is always flying around with new ideas for a new book. He's working on several books at one time. A truly a gifted author. We appreciate uh, Paul Z. Walker's time on today's show. Well, you are listening to Naked, Nudist, and Naturist, episode 53 today. That's right, 53 straight weeks, 53 straight shows. We enjoy being here with you for this hour every single week. You can find us anywhere on podcast land. Yes, we drop Saturday mornings. 6 o'clock a.m. Eastern Time on Spotify, but then we head everywhere. Just type in Naked Nudists and Naturists and you'll find us. And also check out our YouTube previews every Wednesday morning on YouTube at 6 o'clock a.m. I hear music. It must be time for Lisa Monroe. And 
here she is, the one and only, the way over the top, the completely clothes free and fully smiling, our naturism correspondent, Lisa Monroe. Good morning, Lisa. How are you today? Good morning, Frank. I'm doing terrific. And how about you? Not bad at all. You do realize, well, I know you realize because you're pretty smart. This is the first show of our second year. How about that? Time flies, doesn't it? It's just, it's impossible to think of that because it just seems like yesterday we were just thinking, oh, we should do this. Oh, wouldn't that be fun? What would we do? And wow, here we are. (laughs) I know. I remember when I first mentioned it to you, I had already planned in my head how to plot out the show. We'll do this, we'll do that. So I started telling you and you said, Hey, you know, could I be a part of this? <laughs> Which I wasn't expecting and I wasn't going to ask. You know, I, I, I'm not the type to just beg and plead. And you know, But when you came forward, it's like, wow, that's a great idea. And I'm really glad you did because you're a big part of the show. Oh, well, thank and you. as you know, because I share these with you and you get your own emails, a lot of people write in about you, all favorable so far. Whew. All favorable. <laughs> thank goodness. <laughs> The time will come, I'm sure. But but no, it's it it was fun and, and it was like it was just too exciting. I'm like, please, this this yeah. is right up my alley. I love this. So I'm yeah. very thankful that you allowed me to be on Mr. Well, Stone. <laughs> That's one way to look at it. And I'm grateful that you are on. Uh spreading the word and spreading the love for naturism, nudism, or as we like to say, now we've coined two phrases here, not necessarily on purpose just speaking from the heart. And when people write to us, they quote one or both of these. One is clothes free living for all the right reasons. And the other is what I say at the end of the show, have a great clothes free day. (laughs) People people actually put that in their emails, you know, this, that, and the other thing, have a great clothes free day, Frank. I thought, okay, now we're spreading the word about how to spread the word, right? Exactly. And it's a great mindset too, for people to have, you know, they're not coming away with any negativity. They're not coming away with any, any, you know, bad lines or anything they're just coming away with a happy thought and that's the best thing in the world because yeah. what's happier <laughs> yeah you are definitely so which kind of leads into the first topic i wanted to bring up to you people use different terms to describe this i just call it close free living for all the right reasons yes i know that's a long sentence it's not a quick and short and one word and out but others use nudist or naturist and there are a lot of arguments online and i remember about a year ago, it might have been right before we started this, there was an online discussion about this on Twitter, of course. And somebody came up with the idea, what are we arguing for? <laughs> All of us enjoy being without clothes. And if we just constantly shoot at each other, where's the joy in that? Can we just enjoy having our clothes off and go on from there? And I thought, well, that's the best answer of all. <laughs> Why get into semantics? And basically my whole life, I thought I was a nudist mm-hmm. and I might still be, mm-hmm. I don't know. But a few years ago, somebody put into my head, no, you're more of a naturist. Well, I don't even want to get into the differences because every single person I've asked a question of, I've gotten different answers. So there there really is no set answer in stone. What are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, you know how I feel about labels to begin with. I think Mm -hmm. we've over labeled ourselves to the point where if you're this and I'm this, then I can't like you and you can't like me. So I think it came, it comes down even to when someone says, oh, I'm a nudist. Oh, no, I'm a naturist. So, you know, you have to be, you, I, there's, the, there's, I've actually felt this feeling of superiority from some people saying that. But, you know, the fact is, is that, yeah, we're all naked. So it mm-hmm. doesn't really matter what we call ourselves. Yeah. We're all naked. And I think the difference is, because I don't even think of the people who look at naked as um, belonging to a whole nother set of relationships and processes um we're just out here enjoying clothes free living and enjoying life and there is no other connotation to it than that yeah now i know a lot of women uh, yourself included you own uh, pants or shorts you mm-hmm. also own dresses mm-hmm. we don't say oh she's a dress person oh yeah. she's a pants person she just wears clothes well exactly. same with us we just don't wear clothes <laughs> And so to put a label on it, and I don't want to get into a big discussion or on semantics that have people weigh in. That's not the point. I just enjoy clothes for living for all the right reasons. And when you think of it that way, it defeats all of the arguments that could come up. Because again, as the one person online said, what are we arguing with each other for? That's the last thing we're supposed to be doing, right? Exactly. And I think sometimes people within certain groups do start to tend to want to, you know, kind of 
as we say in the South, cut bait <laughs> and, <laughs> and and become, um, you know, yeah. and take sides of things because I, maybe people are inherently have the need to debate. I don't know or argue, but I never have. I just want to be close free. That's it. Yeah, yeah. And if somebody has a really strong opinion one way or the other, we're not arguing with that either. Well, Bottom no. line, there are no arguments here when it comes to being naked yeah. as long as you are. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Accept, right? Don't come in here as a textile. <laughs> oh, wait, I used a label. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Should not have done that. <laughs> That's true. Now, there is another term that people have thrown out. Uh, somebody on this show, in fact, several months ago said it during an interview and some a few people wrote in, hey, wait a minute, what the heck was that term? And it was the term naturalist. Yeah. Now, that has nothing to do with clothes for a living for all the right reasons, or nudist, or naturist. In fact, I looked up uh, on the internet, which means that we know that this is correct because everything on the internet is correct, right? Absolutely. I mean, if you went to the magic site, then right. all is known. <laughs> <laughs> is, uh, the first definition that comes up is an expert or a student of a natural history. So obviously that's not nudism, naturism, clothes for a living, naked. No, it's not It's not that at all. And so we wanted to, just to dispel that. We are not naturalists here. Not that we are or are not students of natural history, but that's not what the show is about. It's about exactly. having our clothes off. I, I, I'll ask your opinion, but I'm, I'm guessing you agree on that. I do. I think, um, you know, as a scientist in a former life, I loved um the study of nature, na naturalist. It's very hard yeah. to say that when you use the saying naturist all the time. That's true. That's it's like, true. oh gosh, I get a point off for misspelling that probably on a <laughs> test. But you know, we can be both. For mm -hmm. you know, all naturalists may not be naturists, but most naturists are some form of naturalist because we appreciate the outdoors. But that still doesn't mean that you can't be naked in the middle of the city, you know, in right. your apartment and never worry about it. So right, no, that's right. And it further goes on to define naturalists make observations of the relationships between organisms and their environments, as well as how those relationships change over time. That, that's all fine and good and well and dandy, but it's not what we do. So uh, I guess we'll just go with uh, nudist, naturist, clothes for a living for all the right reasons. After all, the name of the show is Naked. That's the mm -hmm. first word that was chosen on right. purpose. Naked, nudist, and naturist. We got all three titles on there. And we're not going to engage anybody mm. in arguments or discussions. If you have something to say as a listener, let us know, because we don't argue with that either. You say, by golly, I'm a nudist, and that's just the way it goes, And to which we would say, great, terrific. Your clothes are off. You're enjoying life the way it was intended, right? Well, you know, after all, if you look at our title, Naked, Nudist, and uh, Naturist, we are, we're basically offering those as the definition of being clothes free. So they're sort of like synonyms to us in that, they all mean the same, right. and, but they could mean something else to someone else. That's why we say clothes free living for all the right reasons, and it's why we say have a great clothes free day. We don't get mixed up in it. Just have your clothes off and enjoy life. Exactly. That all works. Right. <laughs> now, the other thing I wanted to mention, uh, I've recently used the term fanny yeah. on the huh. show, and you can tell that I must have been a dad at one point in my life and maybe still am because that, that's a dad word. You know, you, you yeah. can't swear when you have yeah. kids. You can't swear. So you make up words or use uh, less threatening words, you know, behind, backside, fanny. Yes. Use that forever. Well, apparently in other parts of the world that has a different meaning entirely. We got an email from a gentleman in Australia who writes often. I didn't get his permission to quote him by name on this one, but he said, Whoa, I had to look that one up. Are you sure that's what you meant? <laughs> Oops. Were you aware that the word fanny in different parts of the world had a different meaning other than someone's backside? No, I did not. And um, I was kind of surprised when I did because I watch an awful lot of British television. I love their murder mysteries. And yeah. I'm like, I don't know that I've ever heard that connotation used in Britain yeah. and had any idea if they did use it, what it actually meant. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I was a little surprised. Yeah. I mean, this guy said, and I don't want to get too graphic because that's not what we do, but he said it's basically a term, a slang term for female down below parts. Yes. I'll say that as cleanly yes. as I can. Yes. 
which I had no clue about. Obviously, we were not talking about that. No, no, no. We were no. talking about our work on the show, working our fannies off, I think was the connotation we used. I think so. Uh, that's all we meant. That's all I've ever used yeah. for 183 years or however old I am. <laughs> I've used the word <laughs> fanny. Yeah, you're getting just to designate uh, that. Yeah, yeah I, th- I remember my grandmother yelling at us and going, get your fannies in here. You know, it was not... <laughs> I don't think she meant it that way. Uh, no, so, I would say not. So what can you do? I even know a couple of women, one personally, and then one in the entertainment industry. First name is Fanny. You know, yeah. Fanny Smith, Fanny Jones, and obviously right. their parents wouldn't give them that name at birth if, if it meant, I don't even know what it means at that point. It can't mean backside. Like, let's name our daughter backside. No, probably a nickname <laughs> for Francis. beyond that. Yeah, probably a nickname for Francis. So. Could be, yeah. Yeah, so who knows? But there are an awful lot of words. I was reading one, an article once about tra- traveling, and it mm. said, be careful of what gestures you make, what sentences mm. you say, and that kind of thing. Because, mm. uh, you know, the V for victory sign in one place might mean something completely different somewhere else, or a thumbs up, or whatever. Yeah. And so I guess there's just going to be an awful lot of discrepancy, and a lot of times we don't know. So. If we do it, we're sorry. <laughs> yeah. The other one I wanted to mention, uh, use the term Crisco, had to do with a guy I knew years ago, still know him, but not much contact for many years. Yeah. You know, he said, uh, use a sunblock 50, then down to 30, whatever, eight, four, mm-hmm. two, baby oil, and then Crisco. Oh. <laughs> I, I, I'm sure he was kidding. I don't think he would be actually using that. Well, the same guy wrote in from Australia, said, you know, he had to look up the term Crisco. He had never heard of that before. And there I go again, assuming that the term I knew, everybody knew. You know, that's a brand name for shortening. But in my house when I was a kid, where's the Crisco? We need more Crisco. Not that it's healthy to eat. In fact, there have been studies that you might want to stay away from that stuff. But that's shortening for lack of a, well, that is the the generic term, right? Right. It certainly is. And if you grew up in the South, it was not called anything but shortening. I mean, oh, I, I mean, know. but okay. Crisco for shortening, uh, because that was, I mean, that was like the, the staple of the baker's cupboard, and it was always known as Crisco. It's just like soft drinks in the South were known as, as the the biggest soft drink of all, because it was from Atlanta. So, mm-hmm. it's um, yeah, it, it. But again, we don't think about the fact that people outside of the U.S. may not know some of the terms that we use. Right. You know, another one. This didn't come up in conversation, but I've always used the term Kleenex. You need a mm-hmm. tissue? Give me a Kleenex. What, mm-hmm. do you need a box of Kleenex? Mm-hmm. Well, Kleenex is a brand name. Right. There, there is not a Kleenex. There's a company called Kleenex or a product called that. It's tissue, bathroom tissue, whatever you call it. Right. So when you say, give me a Kleenex, well, there is no such thing. <laughs> you can't give somebody a brand name. You give them a tissue. Well, same thing here. Yeah. Crisco is a brand name. Shortening is what it is, right? Yeah, yes. And a lot of words come into our vernacular and then just become adopted as the 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 symbol for what we're trying to say. And it's just quicker to say, yeah. give me that, you know, Kleenex. Yeah. I don't need the Kleenex. Yeah, and, and most people don't even know that. Mm-hmm. And obviously, I'm one of them. <laughs> when, <laughs> when I mentioned Crisco and Fanny, two words yeah. I've used probably since I was able to talk. But exactly. We appreciate the listeners writing in because we, we learn stuff on this show, too. We're not just here to pontificate and tell you. You tell us and we learn together, right? Exactly. Lisa, that's the best way to go, isn't it? It's always fun to learn. You got it. And with that, we are going to head for the hills. Lisa Monroe, our weekly correspondent on naturism. Go out there and have a great close-free week. And we'll see you next time. Absolutely. You too. Have a wonderful close-free week. Bye. All right. Thank you. Bye. The terrific Lisa Monroe. We appreciate her very much around here for these segments, for her baked goods. Yes, she's a really good chef, but also for her website work, her meme creation. Just a great person to have on our team here. We appreciate Lisa Monroe very much. Well, you are listening to Naked, Nudist, and Naturist, episode 53 today. Thank you for being with us. Really enjoying this time together with you as we celebrate clothes-free living for all. Now let's get to part one of my interview with Philip Oak. Wrote a book entitled... Surprised into Freedom, the Effortless Obliteration of Lust and Body Shame, part one of my interview with the very terrific Philip Oak. We're going to head over to Missouri today to talk to a gentleman who was on the show before, I believe it was episode 30, back in January. He wrote a book called Surprised into Freedom, the Effortless Obliteration of Lust and Body Shame, and he also runs a website, 
a blog called Aching for Eden. We'll get all the details on that. Everything is in the show notes as well. But let's bring him in for his longer interview today from Missouri, the very terrific Philip Oak. Good morning, Philip. How are you today, sir? Good morning. I'm doing well, Frank, and it's good to be back on here with you. Yeah, glad to have you back as well. How's life treating you in Missouri? Is it getting, uh, I'm guessing it's definitely warm enough to get outside in the nude, at least I hope so. Yes. Uh, yesterday felt a little bit like a, being in a furnace, so <laughs> it was pretty miserable to have clothes on. <laughs> it's bearable with clothes off. Yeah, well, that part of the country gets really hot. People don't realize just how hot it gets there because you don't have really, you know, well, obviously you don't have either ocean close to you. You're just kind of stuck in the middle and the sun just bakes you and cooks you, right? Indeed, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have you been there your whole life, so you're kind of used to this, or you're a fairly recent f transplant or what? No, but uh, most of my adult life has been in Missouri. Of course, okay. I, I grew up in South America, uh, in Chile. Oh. oh I was wow. born there. Um, okay. My parents uh, were missionaries there okay. and um, moved to Missouri before starting eighth grade. Oh, I'll be darned. I didn't realize that. What's it like down there in terms of naturism, nudism, more accepting down there? I'm guessing, and maybe not, though. Uh, no, I don't think so. And I, I wouldn't have known because uh, I didn't, didn't practice naturism at the time. And, True. Uh, yeah. But I did see an article just the other day that mentioned two nude beaches in Chile. Okay. So now I'm like, oh, I'd like to go down and check those out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Your old hometown, maybe. I talked to a woman uh, from Brazil, obviously a different country, but same continent. She said nudism is very accepted there. It's almost oh. expected. She said you can be in your front yard, you know, cutting the grass, trimming the weeds, whatever, and fully nude, and it's no problem. I know a lot of Latin American countries, um, because of the strong like Catholic influence um, yeah. and, and religious kind of the indoctrination, the modesty, um, it's not well accepted. And so that's kind of part of my mission is to uh, to say, hey, you know, the, the Bible is not against non-sexual nudity. Uh, you know, nudity for all the right reasons, as you like to say, yeah. is okay. <laughs> it right. can be reconciled with, with yeah. the Christian faith. Well, not only reconciled, uh, there are some who will say it calls for it. it. It's Satan who came along and started putting clothes on us. I mean, to a degree, right. do you agree with that or do you agree with that all the way? Yeah, yeah, we're getting... Deep into the woods here early here, Frank. Uh, <laughs> Might as well, right? <laughs> but but I, I agree. And, and for me, it was a huge shift um, from everything that I'd been taught previously, everything I believed. In fact, I had to tell, uh, you know, my kids, um, it, it threw them for a loop. And it was like, they said, this goes against everything that you taught us before. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, but it goes against yeah. everything I'd been taught before for a lot longer. When you know the truth, <laughs> uh, Jesus said in John 8, the truth will make you free. And if you are free, you are free indeed. And it always does. I've had experiences with that, with, with some other issues not related to naturism. But yes, the truth sets you free. It's when you try to hide a lie or deception. You bob and weave, you get stressed, you sweat it out, you lose sleep. Oh boy, what if they find out about this? You just put the truth out there, and all of a sudden, oh, that feels pretty good. <laughs> and so the truth does set you free, no matter what it is, including being nude, right? Yeah. And what, what better definition of free than being nude? Yeah, exactly. Open and vulnerable and uh, humble. And that's, you know, people talk about modesty. What is more modest, according to the word, than simple nudity? <laughs> right. Right. You know, modesty is, is not a dress code. It's an attitude. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in Webster's Dictionary, for uh, many years, it had no mention of clothing um, because it was about that spirit that one has. Yeah. And so, you know, there's a famous uh, modesty proof text. You know, you can use the Bible to say anything if you've got, you know, an, an agenda behind it. And so there's one about being modest in First Timothy 2. But Paul's message there is about not dressing gaudy, not being ostentatious, not flaunting your wealth right. in, in the church. And that's what he's talking about, modesty, uh, not, not about covering up your body. And when we cover up our bodies, we're literally covering up the image of God. <laughs> well, yeah. we're, it's yeah. said from the very start 
in Genesis that we are made in his image and yeah. that that image is very good. Uh, mm -hmm. Genesis 2.25. Yeah. And a lot of people start in Genesis 3. They forget the reverse prior to Genesis 3 is <laughs> 225 that uh the the man and the woman were naked and not ashamed. There you go. That's exactly it. And you're right, he did say after he created everything, including man and woman, clothes free, nude, it's all good. He was very pleased with his work. Well, that that should say a whole bunch. And not all of our listeners are believers in Jesus Christ. So we are getting biblical today, no question about it. But if he made it made us that way, probably ought to stay that way. I'm guessing, right? <laughs> Just as common sense. Well, yeah, it's interesting. You know, um, there are the seven days of creation, you know, and or six days of creation, and, and then a day off. Um, right. It's important to take a day off. So I suggest you go to a, a, a nude place. On your day <laughs> off. <laughs> but That's after right. everything he created, day one, day two, he said it's good. Yeah. Then day six, he you know he creates man, and then ultimately a woman. Mm -hmm. He doesn't say it was good. That's the only time he doesn't say it's good. He says it's very good. Yeah. So um, out of all creation, everything that God created and his creation is beautiful. I mean, think of all the things, the Grand Canyon, the mountains, uh, a, a tree, just waterfalls, rivers, lakes, ocean. Yeah. God's favorite creation. You're looking yeah, <laughs> at it. I'm, I'm looking at it. It's, it's you and me. It's, uh, right. it's humankind is the pinnacle of God's creation. Yeah, that's right. And so why, why should we, why should we drape and cover up? God's favorite creation, you know, we don't, mm -hmm. the, the prudish um, kind of reaction to bodies with body shame is to avert the eyes or cover it up. And we never say, oh, look, this beautiful tree. Oh, you know, let's, let's, right. uh, uh, let's build a wall. And so we can't see this, the sunset. No, let me shield my eyes. Yeah. But uh, so it's so people think that they're doing the right thing by, um, by being this way and having this attitude, but it's, it's the opposite. <laughs> it is. I want to read a, a quote that's on your blog website. We'll get that address from you in a moment. But it's about your book, Surprised Into Freedom. And it's the very first one. It's R.B. Mirrors is the man, man's name, woman's name. And he or she says, I wish I could have read this book at 20. Would you like to be free from porn issues, free forever with no concern of slipping up? The giant side effect to this cure is complete loss of harmful self-image issues. This book isn't too good to be true. It's too good to miss reading. If your Christian walk is planted in worldly thinking, this book will rescue you, but will tear you out of that infertile ground by the roots. It will beautify your walk with God and shine into every relationship in your life. Now, obviously, that's very heavy. And the reason I brought that up first is I've known people, and I still know people, uh, who were into porn. I don't know anybody on the personal level now who is, at least as far as I know. And every one of them have said the same thing. As soon as they became closed free, turned to the word of God, all of a sudden, and literally all of a sudden, maybe the same day, they no longer had a desire for porn or sexual images or videos or anything else. Can you explain exactly how that works or, and or why it works? I would love to. And, and first, I want to say R.B. Mears is a dear friend um, who I just got to see uh, this last weekend. And, and he's an author himself. Uh, he would okay. be a great guest on your show. Oh, wrote okay. a, writes novels uh, that kind of explain these principles, too, uh, starting with one called Chain Breakers. Okay. But it is, you know, uh, the, I call the book the effortless <laughs> obliteration because yeah. it is so easy and it's it's something that, you know, I battled, uh, to use a word, um, a word familiar in Christian terminology, they call it every man's battle. Mm -hmm. Um, and so just, just that alone, you're admitting defeat before you start Because if you, if you think it's going to be a battle, it's going to be a battle, Yeah. but it's all about renewing your mind and the practice of social nudity, um, changes the mind and, and it, it's not about objectifying people. It's about seeing, 
seeing people as they are, seeing the image of God in everyone, seeing as God sees. But for me, I struggled 20 years with a, with a pornography habit. Mm -hmm. It was a cause of a lot of shame for me. It was kind of, you know, my secret, you know, uh, some people close to me knew and they were struggling as well. Mm -hmm. And with no end in sight, trying to stop, trying to white knuckle, knuckle, trying willpower, trying prayer, trying everything that the Christian world, you know, tells you you can do just without any real success. You know, you might have moments of uh, victory, but it wasn't sustained in the long haul. Right. And so when I made this change, I wanted to, you know, wait even a year before telling my wife, like, I want to make sure that. I'm different and I didn't have to wait that long because it's like, yeah. no, I've never felt this way before. Yeah. Like it's gone. The, yeah. the urge for what is, you know, uh, kind of more degrading, you know, because porn, it was destructive to my relationship. You know, it, it, mm -hmm. it was bad for my mind. Um, but naturism is not porn. <laughs> it's, no. it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. And that, mind shift just changed everything so I, I delve into that in great detail in the book and tell, tell our personal story of the timeline of how, how this all worked out yeah yeah very much so I heard uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the guy by the name of Dr. James Dobson he ran focus on the family forever now he left that ministry and he's running a family talk Dr. Dobson's family talk or something uh -huh. probably 30 years ago maybe 35 years ago, he was talking about porn because he had been selected to be on some federal commission on porn. He and a bunch of, you know, he's a psychologist, has his PhD in psychology. So he and other so-called experts were called in, let's study this whole thing. What does it really mean? And of course they had to see images and watch videos, like to try to analyze. And he said, it's, it's the sickest he's ever been in his life physically. And he, to this day, and I think it was maybe 10 years after the committee, he said he still hadn't really recovered from just the the harshness and the cruelty and the the awfulness of it. But he said something very interesting, and this I've passed along to as many people as I can when the topic comes up. He said, uh, pornography is like a drug because it's oh. highly addictive. You start off with, a, a, from a man's point of view, a woman smiling, then maybe a woman in a bikini, then a topless woman, then fully nude woman, and then, hey, let's have some action before you know it. Oh, I just can't get enough ordering, you know, all the magazines in the mail and every video possible. Go, now we can go online and fire up anything. And it gets out of control fairly quickly. And when he said in terms of an addiction, he also said it's a silent addiction because if somebody is an alcoholic, for example, they usually see some signs. They stumble uh -huh. a little... You never see them after 6 p.m. at night ever, you know, because they're passed out. If they're drug addicted, those signs eventually show their way in friendships and relationships and at the workplace. He said, but porn, you don't really see because it is a hidden a deal. You know, you don't do it in the middle of the street or at your desk at work. You do it when you're alone, when you're quiet, and nobody's around. Maybe hopefully nobody will find out, but it's still having the same effect as drugs or alcohol or some other addiction. And when it finally does spill over, when somebody does find out and calls you on the carpet for it, like a wife, for example, they tend to be the best pornography killers in the world sometimes when they discover their husband has been viewing this. And a lot of men see nothing wrong with it, but we've just kind of explained everything that's wrong with it. Perfect. But he said it is like an addiction. And if you're not careful, and of course, he, he is a Christian psychologist, but he also relies heavily on counseling. You know, we, we should get into counseling quickly. But you're more into the Word of God. Maybe explain that. Why is that so substantially successful? People are in porn. They study the Word of God on nudity, naturism, close free living for all the right reasons, and suddenly they feel happy and free, and they've been released from the chains of porn. Yeah, it's 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 so interesting because if you've got the wrong attitude, you can lust after someone who's fully clothed. Mm -hmm. You can yeah. lust after someone. You know, in, in the most extreme cases, uh, in a burqa, you know, sure, the, sure. Absolutely. Uh, I know naturists who came out of um, the Amish world, you know, where they're dressed very modestly. Mm -hmm. And there are those silent cases of 
uh, sexual abuse um, mm-hmm. in secret. You know, so it's, right. it's devastating when you've got the wrong mindset. The porno prudish mindset is what I like to call it. And I borrow that from David Hatton, who's another author and, uh, mm-hmm. and friend. And what he is saying is that the church in many regards is agreeing with pornographers in having the same definition of our bodies. You know, pornographers thrive and on the fact that our bodies, um, you know, are, are strictly sexual and, you know, to be, to be viewed that way. Well, the church in essence agrees with that and saying, cover it up. You know, flee from all that. You know, and, um, and so they confuse nudity with sex, and and so the church should not <laughs> agree with that. Um, the church prudery and and the pornographic mind are two sides of the same coin. Yeah, they're cut from the same cloth. They, in essence, agree with the same view of our bodies. Well, we already said uh, we were made naked and unashamed, and that was very good. Mm-hmm. So that's how it starts. We need yeah. to start there, yeah. and we need to say God didn't change His mind right. in the next chapter, in the next verse. <laughs> uh, everybody assumes that Adam and Eve put on their fig leaves. That was a you know terrible idea. Um, out of shame, the text never says shame. Yeah. It's not in Genesis three at all. It's fear. They covered themselves out of fear, and the Lord came looking for them because that was you used to walk with them every day in the cool of the day, and all of a sudden they they missed their their appointment, you know. And <laughs> God's like, Adam, where are you? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he knew where he was, but yeah, yeah. Uh, it's given him an opportunity to to fess up, to enter back into that sweet relationship, but instead they hid. That's what human tendency is, and and he said, I, I, we hid because we were afraid and, and because we were naked. So they had the realization with the not fruit of the knowledge of good and evil that they were naked. They'd never had that concept before, but God, interestingly enough, asks the question and it gets glossed over by preachers all the time. I was just in church, uh, in a Genesis, uh, sermon the other day and they read the text, but they, they didn't explain it at all. God asks. Who told you you were naked? Yeah. And yeah. so think about that. Who's who's there on the scene? It's Adam, Eve, and that crafty serpent. Yeah, that's right. A serpent that hates the image of God, mm-hmm. hates what, what it represents, and, and, you know, convinced them to eat of this fruit, the forbidden fruit. And so maybe he convinced them that their nakedness is something bad yeah. lewd obscene yeah yeah um and so god in his grace and mercy gives them um skin coming uh, coverings uh, garments you know a coat um because they're about to be out of eden you know so my blog is called aching for eden i want to get back to uh that that paradise uh, mm-hmm. um at least that state of mind that is eden right. and all the uh ideals of Eden, but they got kicked out and God's like, Hey, your environment's about to change. I'm going to give you, you know, you're going to need a blanket at night. <laughs> you're yeah. going to need something for all these thorns and thistles that are part of this curse that, yeah. you know, the curse ultimately is going to be restored, you know, and Jesus said, I am making all things new. Well, sometimes the church says, well, you can't have that, uh, now you can't have that that's for the future. And I say, no, Jesus prayed thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Yeah. If we want to undo the curses of the fall, you know, we want to be in right relationship with, with God and with others. Well, you know, why not go all the way and just adopt the same mindset that, that, uh, our bodies are good, no matter what you look like, you know, we want to, we want to treat our bodies, right. Uh, agree with those things that, mm-hmm that um we we were created good and uh that's god's intent you know so um it's it's as god intended for us to be how he created us in eden so let's uh, i ache for 
for that restoration and I try to live it out day to day. Yeah, that's the way to do There's so it. much more, you know, there's so much more we could get into about the Bible, like the prophets, you know, prophesying yeah. in the new. God even told Isaiah in Isaiah 20, hey, go, you, you need to go nude and barefoot. He added yeah. that. So just for <laughs> those people that say, oh, he wasn't all totally nude. No, he was <laughs> naked and barefoot for three years. And God told him to do that as a yep. sign. And so, you know, if it's if it's a sin, does God tell someone to sin? No. Uh, yeah, good point. Well, I had, uh, and not everybody, as I mentioned a few moments ago, believes in the Bible or God or Jesus. In fact, they get offended right. when you bring it up. And yeah. I have thoughts on that as well. But this is reasonably new information, even to me. I would say well, it was in the last four or five years. When I finally, finally put two and two together and came up with four, you know, if you look at uh, the Hollywood industry, obviously the movies and TV shows and uh, even things for kids, highly sexualized. And let's say back in the 50s, for example, before I was born, legitimately so. I like to say I'm 27. Obviously, that's a joke, <laughs> but I'm not old enough to remember the 50s. But if you see movies from the 40s or 50s, there's no nudity. Everybody's, you know, the men are mostly in suits. The women are mostly in dresses, no matter what the scene is. It's just how they dress. And then in the 60s, a little bit of skin started to show. And by the 70s, it was just, hey, baby, now we're all naked. And that's basically when porn started to pro proliferate on a mass scale. And it goes back to what you said, you know, God made us naked. We were literally born that way. And that, you know, people <laughs> throw that out as, as a joke. And sometimes I do too, just to be cute and funny and a ha ha moment. But just think about it for a moment. He really did. You know, he, he's all mighty, all powerful God. He could have had us born, uh, you and I as men in a three piece suit with, you know, spiffy <laughs> shoes and everything else. And women, you know, in a nice uh, dress with pearls and a hat and, or a, uh, you know, a pantsuit, whatever, whatever he wanted to do, he could have done. He, he basically said, no, nude is the way to go, but not sexualized. It, it's never about that. But Satan did, in my view, and I think yours too, twisted everything around. Okay, God made it for good. I'm going to find a way to make it for bad. And in my book, uh, he has succeeded victoriously beyond belief. What do you think? Yeah, I think um, Mark Twain is quoted as saying, if, if God wanted us uh, naked, we would have been born that way. <laughs> and uh, But if you want a Bible verse, uh, Job, uh, Job says, naked I came and naked I will go. Yeah. <laughs> Blessed yeah. be the name of the Lord. But yes, um, our real enemy, I have a chapter on that in the book. He viciously uh, attacks this very thing. And he has throughout history. Yeah. Because it's so so powerful, he wants people to be uh, messed up from their minds and to be uh, looking looking at each other with uh, you know lustful hearts. And like I said, you can do that if someone's naked or if they're fully clothed. He wants to cause havoc, and like you said, he's been very successful. And mm -hmm. so we think it's it's hard to to think differently, but it's not. You just have to to do that brave first step. And, and it comes easy and it's so surprising. You know, if I could share um, yeah. just an example, just this last week, I got to meet Wilson, actually shared a tent with, with him and another uh, friend that I've known for years online, but have never met in person. Right. And he just gave me a hug and immediately when, when we got there, and just said, thank you. Because he had been looking for an answer for a long time, just like, like I did. Yeah. He went to our site looking for pornography. Wow. But what he found was, was something completely different. And he found the freedom that he, he never could achieve on his own before. And here's the other interesting thing about Wilson. He wrote a blog for our site, a guest blog. Okay. Be transformed. And, um, it's a, it's a neat little article and. I recently got a comment from someone else uh, in a note in an email, someone who stumbled on my site looking for pornography and read Wilson's <laughs> article. That's great. And now, now he has freedom. So <laughs> it's just amazing. 
It really is. There's no question the hand of God was on that. Okay, young man, you're looking for porn? Hey, check out this site by Philip Oak, <laughs> and we'll get you turned around here. I remember there was a show, and I'm not really old enough to remember this, and I've seen it on, on video, uh, Love American Style. I don't know if you know that show, ever heard about it. I think it was in the 60s, maybe early 70s, not sure. Uh, but every episode had maybe three different skits about love American style, you know, things people go through in dating and all that jazz. And there was one time a guy went to a strip club, obviously to see women take their clothes off. And this one woman took her clothes off, except she left her gloves on. She never took her gloves off on stage. Okay. Well, you know, whatever. And he kept going back in the same routine and I started talking to her. They developed a relationship. And of course, you know, being the late sixties, early seventies, they ended up back at his place or a hotel or whatever, and uh, they took their clothes off, and they're going to do whatever people do when they meet like that. And uh, she got nude except she left the gloves on. And he said, uh, well, let's take the gloves off here. because, oh, no, no, I can't let you see me fully nude. <laughs> 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 you know, just to play on the whole ridiculousness of the whole thing. Like you said earlier, you know, people can lust after a fully clothed woman or a fully clothed man. And here's a woman fully nude, except she had her gloves on. He was still lusting for more. Like, I got to see your hands, you know, otherwise you're not fully nude. Uh, kind of a ludicrous uh, skit to watch, but at the same time, it illustrates quite a bit about the human mind. When you just keep looking for that stuff, uh, the mind gets all twisted around. Now you don't even know which end is up. So I like to kind of joke sometimes, like if, if they're in our culture, you know, we sexualized elbows, then we would have to keep our elbows uh, covered. Very and true. I mean, what a what a crazy thing to think uh, an, an elbow that's not that's not sexualized. So, yeah. but uh, I think cultures like India, you know, it's ankles sure. that are sexualized. So sure. they they have to be covered. Yeah. And so for us, you know, I'm, you know, we sexualize the degree of breasts, and and so where even a nursing mother, it's scandalous. <laughs> it's like, cover that sure. up. Sure. You know, and, and, and sadly, churches have different rooms where mothers are supposed to go to nurse and they have a video feed of what's, you know, mm -hmm. in Africa, you just, in, in Latin America, there's a place that you just nurse right there where you are without shame. And that's the way it should be. We shouldn't be sexualizing uh, someone who's is doing the best that they can for their kid and giving them uh, that, that, that food, um, no, directly right. from their body. What you sexualize is what you're going to focus on. And clothing actually accentuates that, that mm -hmm. lust, you know, mm -hmm. it's, um, when you, when you see someone fully nude, you know, and in a nature's community, you're, you're off, you know, looking at them in the eyes and you're, you're mm -hmm. seeing the whole person and you're, you're appreciating their story and mm -hmm. who they are as, as people. And, and it's a beautiful thing. And gone are those issues that, that, um, that so many people have in this world, uh, whether they, they know it or not. So this has revolutionized our family and, um, and my relationship with my wife. I, I don't know if I can get into any of that. Sure. Um, you know, the book calls the effortless obliteration of lust and body shame. So lust was my issue. Right. That was that was my uh, deep dark sin that you know uh, that I didn't want anyone to know about. Right. But I knew that I had. The terrific Philip Oak. Check out his book, Surprised into Freedom, The Effortless Obliteration of Lust and Body Shame. Also check out his website, Aching for Eden. And on episode 54 next week, we'll have part two of my interview with the very terrific Philip Oak. And also next week, an extended, a very long segment with Lisa Monroe and myself. You've been asking for it, so next week you get it. An extended segment with the very terrific Lisa Monroe. Well, thank you for joining us today on Naked, Nudist, and Naturist, episode 53 today. We give you a brand new show every Saturday morning at 6 o'clock a.m. Eastern Time. Continue to join us. Check us out on our website, nakednudistandnaturist.com, Spotify, Google, Amazon slash Audible, Apple Podcasts, and also on Twitter. You can write us anywhere, anytime, anyplace. And uh, we thank you for being with us uh, today. 
Plan to join us for every single one of our shows here and have your clothes off when you're listening. We have our clothes off when we're broadcasting, enjoying the naturist life. We celebrate clothes-free living for all. Remember to enjoy being naked and join us again for Naked Nudist and Naturist. We drop a brand new show every Saturday morning, so come back and join us. Have your clothes off when you do for Naked Nudist and Naturist. Have a great clothes-free day.